Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. I'm going to dive into it. The title is, Are We Nature's Artwork? Sorry guys, I got interrupted here. Are we nature's artwork? Are we nature's artwork? Usually you gotta ask the artist about the artwork, but in this case, it's very difficult. Human beings, let us begin not from our past. Let us begin from where we are now and how we're looking at the future, and then I will bring the past in. A creature or the idea of a creature is simultaneous with the activity that sets that creature apart. And when you look at human beings, especially the lineage, uh, our evolutionary lineage, human beings have in some sense expressed their inner realms and the outer realms in ways no other creature has. You know, there are early <coughs> cave paintings. And when we wonder about that urge, that urge for there being something, imagine you're an early human being, what reason would you have to draw on a cave wall? Perhaps a certain acknowledgement of time Human beings create art, and if you suddenly imagine somebody drew art, you know, and you woke up in that artwork, so when we wonder about the design of nature, I believe they call this the cosmological argument in philosophy, where we are looking at the design, the design of phenomena, and wondering as if who drew this art this work of art that we're living in. <clears throat> Seeing nature like all artwork is helpful. You know, I started seeing every ideology as if it is the artwork of the moment. It has to do with my inner realms in fusion with the outer realms. The inner realms of the person as Mr. Within defines, is behind your eyes, whatever you'd like to call it. 
behind your eyes what does that mean that means once you close your eyes there is a subjective uh, realism to you and that subjective realism is the inner realms <clears throat> now when we look at evolution we are either man's effort we're either an individual creature that's separated or we are nature we are the world moving right now that means regardless of name ideology class there's a huge probability we are all one field right now <laughs> <clears throat> when you treat uh, ideas like art you don't fight them and you don't worship them you just see the effort they were in the moment you see it's um, this world can be seen as an empty room and we can say that if the human being doesn't have a contentment with this emptiness of reality the person is trying to fulfill something and it's very strange it's like we are chasing something as a temporary animal that is not even a thing I feel most people they don't need things in their life they just want to uh, experience greater wins if I can say that greater winds of experience you see imagine uh, <clears throat> there are um, let's say all the billionaires in the world gathered around let's say and they all decided that they were bored of physical desire if they they've literally had everything they wanted to desire Do you know so they're bored of physical desire you know then it would be as if what would you desire beyond the physical this is a good question if somebody asks you what do you want from your moment that is not physical you would most likely want to be in a future event and that's where the expressive urge comes from in the human being you know it's uh, the moment you see yourself in a story in the present instantly your subconscious has already solidified the past and started wielding the future <clears throat> sculpting the future in the science fiction work uh, that I've been working on it's still it's this giant book I'm writing it's called the messenger of giants the name of the book and it's set in the year 5025 and in the, in one of the chapters i don't remember which i had written about the history of the world in this sci-fi universe and it's set in the year 5025 so <clears throat> i remember i had written that for they had elected the first artist that went into politics the first artist that became in some sense entered the political system revolutionized the whole political system <clears throat> this is a science, science fiction context guys I, I write um, <clears throat> science fiction so this is something I'm sharing about it um, I remember I'd written that there is in the government of the world has changed and it became the enlightened society <clears throat> the enlightened society instead of this scrutinizing against archaic art ideas instead of saying this religion is wrong that philosophy is wrong that science is wrong that pattern is wrong the enlightened society had realized most things of design come arise from some sort of effort 
Now, human beings are that part of nature that has a conscious effort. So technically, you are living artwork. But you are artwork that in your inner realms you hold, you draw yourself, in the outer realms nature moves you. Your survival instincts draw, uh, drive you. I wish I had the chapter here to read it for you. I don't have it here. <clears throat> but this idea that the enlightened society started treating everything as art, do you know what that means? That means we treat all language <laughs> as if it's, it's like the art of your child you're putting on your fridge. What does that mean? That means there is a, a common denominator that can't be judged. From the dirt of this world arose a civilization that could acknowledge the unknown. So I'll just mute it when the sound of the truck comes. Human beings are creatures that have design. This design is being acknowledged as a relationship between space and matter. 
Space is that we can't touch. It is that which is unknown. It is that which is field-like. Your mind, your awareness is like consciousness plus space. You know, your body is like consciousness plus matter. You know, we are thinking that we're material beings and there's no sort of <clears throat> mysterious field at work. But Mr. Within is telling you guys, it's like we're going to realize it in, in, a, in the future that there is energy not discriminating against its own flow. I remember reading this book by Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist. It's a great book. There is, um, <clears throat> in this narrative, there is this interesting development of the character where the character at the end of the journey returns home to find the treasure. Now, I took that story to heart and it had such an impression on me because I started caring for who I was. And I started looking at my memories and trying to see uh, why those decisions were made. You know, something that people don't consider that, you know, we have an experience of linear time where past, in, in, we're in the present now, we were in the past, and now we're going into the future. <clears throat> but as far as I'm concerned, when the child wakes up, the first conscious memory, there is no past. Only if the child moves, if only if the creature moves, suddenly there seems to be this ambiance of, an air, of some sort of movement before the conception. You know, I think I, I, I may have a ra rather uncommon view on this. <clears throat> For me, when it comes to art, the inspiration of the brush is a different dimension, and the brush, or whatever you use, sometimes I use pen to draw, the, <clears throat> the awareness to the ability of the pen, and the awareness to the ability of my hand, and the awareness to the ability of my hand holding the pen it's like an oscillation from everything being it's it's like you know what it is it's like noticing your heartbeat but you realize you're being the whole heart you're being the whole body do you know so i would say it's a zooming in and out of phenomena and this zooming in and out of phenomena gives the impression of <clears throat> a journey. Imagine you were a being that was just this attention that you appeared in the simplest way existence would occur, <clears throat> or let's say the most complex way existence occur could occur, and you arise in the uh, on the other edge, you arise in the simplest way you can experience reality. There are moments I've had with nature that are silent. There is no concept. It's as if the concepts uh, honor the mind. This is a strange idea, but I feel we right now have a sort of <clears throat> relationship with the mind through information. That means we care about how things are informed. I feel uh, we're going to evolve way past this and it's not we're not going to care about the form because we're going to realize the form is endless we're going to care about what's moving the, the, <clears throat> we're going to care about the primal mover of uh, energy what is moving energy as you and we can say it's an analysis of The voice of the environment, 
defining you and your voice defining your moment. This talk that I'm giving, it's, 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 <clears throat> it hovers with the validity of my inner realms. I do perceive physical reality, but then I ask myself, let me assume that it's just atoms in the middle of nowhere. For how long can that be assumed? For how many eons will we not wonder about the other? You know, we're visible creatures. There's a, uh, it's as if we are visible creatures, but we, we are not even acknowledging our own shadow. You know, materialists fear the shadow of their mind. Because the mind is not an object, where has it been said or uh, put into stone that what humanity is, is purely an object? You see, there is always an unknown component to it. The form is, but what moves the form isn't an object. We're, we're a subjective-oriented species. <clears throat> any artwork is a step into the unknown it doesn't matter if somebody tells you um, draw whatever just draw like a square on a piece of paper or somebody tells you draw a self-portrait or something on a piece of paper you know <clears throat> you're gonna see it's all about coming to the unknown trusting the unknown honestly attempting and then you see a uh, result Excuse me. When I look at nature, it doesn't need a voice. It's the honest, like can you imagine? Like the whole idea of simulation theory means Gaia has been dishonest with its own children. <clears throat> if this world is thought to be a simulation, then the world has lied to man. There is one where the person is lying to themselves about the world. They are, they are choosing not to perceive an angle outside of an ethnocentrism. <clears throat> or the person... I don't know, after some point, I think every human being, it's natural. Just like you get a sense of looking around you and be checking your space, your physical space, I feel the mind is checking reality in a similar way. <clears throat> that means just like uh, the alertness of the human being, you look around your environment, you notice what's going on. Similarly, the mind is looking. We can say the mind is a strange way of saying it, but it's a looker. <laughs> is a seer. <laughs> you know, seldom this is said, but find finds, uh, sorry, I'll say it again. Uh, luck finds those who look. So many things in this life that so many people have opinions on, but unless you experientially test the waters, you'll never be certain of it. Do you know? It's it's like somebody explaining to you horse riding, you know, or skydiving. It's like how much can they really give you the experience by just speaking it? You know, at some point you have to wonder about the position of your own intelligence, its relationship with the environment, and the intensity of the implication of the linguistic uh, uh, simulation upon the environment. That means everything we see, everything that you can 
talk about is existing in the linguistic simulation. <clears throat> This computer I can speak about, it's existing in the linguistic simulation. There's a word for it. But how many states of being have there been where there have been no words? For me, knowledge at first appeared as just memor as a sort of learning different alphabets. You know, like if you if you really look at what knowledge is, is different eyes of human beings who have pursued certain directions. You know, for me, what fascinated about history was I stopped seeing uh, people with their titles or their professions or their uh, overall image. I I started seeing people as if they were human beings looking at something. When I think of every philosopher, it makes me wonder how did they confront the unknown? How did they uh, enter uh, a realm where the past couldn't help? <clears throat> because that's kind of like the unknown. It's, it's like, um, I mean, depends what human beings want. I'll tell you this. Uh, it's as if you are the programmer of your own life, but you don't realize the programmer is not a you. It's your pr attention, but as your presence, your energetic presence. <clears throat> there was once my, uh, it came like, I don't know, how would I say it? Like I wrote, I remember writing something that I felt it was like the whispers of the logos through my fingers. And it was, it was this creative writing, this writing I would do. And in it, Ah, uh, what was the idea? I just had the image over again. <sighs> the thought escapes me. You know what's what's interesting? Imagine <clears throat> someone taking a snapshot of you and then years pass by and they see you and if you don't look exactly like the snapshot, they don't believe you are you. And you tell them, guys, it's me. You know, but they're like, no, it's not this photo. That's, to me, the thing about ideology it is snapshots in time and you as a person I, like there was a time I was thinking I, I saw all these statistics here let me look it up right now okay I don't even know how they're doing the surveys for these statistics but let's, let's look it up you know it was um, <clears throat> I, usually the audience in the analytics it says it's from the state so let's see um, There we go. So World Health Organization. This is the statistics on, there should be some statistics on depression, global depression. Let's see how, how we're measuring global depression. <clears throat> Here, depression is a common illness worldwide with more than 264 million people affected. Depression is different from usual mood fluctuations and short-lived emotional responses to challenges in everyday life. Especially when long-lasting and with moderate or severe intensity, depression may become a serious health condition. It can cause the affected person to suffer greatly and function poorly at work, at school, and in the family. At its worst, depression can lead to... <coughs> Here it says suicide. Close to 800,000 people die due to suicide every year. <sighs> suicide is the second leading cause of death in 15 to 29 year olds. Oh my God. This is, am I reading a horror film? You know, 
So guys, here's the thing. Now, this is Mr. Within this argument to any person who's ever thought about this idea of depression or I mean, it says 264 million people are depressed on it. <laughs> so so check this out. Of course, we don't know what what people are living. If if your uh, if your nations at war, uh, then of course you're depressed. You know, <clears throat> if your culture is destroyed, of course you will be depressed. You know, but here's the thing, right? It's like a candle, and it's depression being how bright the light of the candle is, and it's like regardless of whatever has happened. And whatever will happen, it's like this candle that's here for a little while. Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> that means it was as if there was a time where I, I remember I had, I wanted, I had this mentality of this retaliation against everything that I thought was an enemy in my mind. Then I realized, oh my God, nature's going to be way more cruel than me to the person because to every person because we're temporary <laughs> do you know that means it's like that's why I'm saying we have to be playful because the ending of life is incredibly intense so we got to be a, a conscious of it you know so for me this idea of depression I mean it, it, the question comes who is depressed and how is the depression is, be, is, is being judged? And do you know enough about what will happen to be depressed? That means as long as the future exists, I don't know how, how a person can feel there's nowhere to move, you know? You know what it is? It's like the human being is born as this raw, attributeless presence of attention. And the moment it finds some sort of individuality, that individuality becomes a container of various linguistic systems. So I would say that the story has not finished. So how can you measure the character midway in the journey? That means, does it make sense for the climber to be depressed middle of the way in the mountain? Does it make sense? Imagine you want to climb a mountain. Does it make sense being in the middle of the way and being like, oh, I'm depressed. It's like, it's like, why are you on the mountain? You know, why are you here? And you see it's a four billion year old evolutionary opportunity. That means even if you as a human being on this planet, don't do anything. Even though I, I'm not saying like be that renounce, <laughs> don't be like one of those people who renounce renounce renounces activity. That's like uh, that's too far. <laughs> <coughs> we don't want to get that zen about it. But but I'm saying like there is a value to life, and you're a pilot, and it's like what's the value of the airplane? Where the pilot goes. where the pilot goes you fear the unknown you can't carry the what you know believe it or not you fear the unknown you forget a lot of things in life the unknown is nothing to fear because you realize there's a part of you that is unknown and when you can accept the unknown in you and then you can accept the unknown in others, then civilization's speed and advancement, it just gets high speed, you know? People are thinking of 5G, you know, uh, being super high speed for phones, I'll tell you. It's kind of like, what about a 5G civilization? <laughs> a civilization that is endless efficiency because i'm telling you when when we do so, when we have the first grand victory we're kind of like like you know um i would tell you we're like a losing team humanity is losing whatever it's doing on this planet it doesn't seem like winning you know <laughs> it seems more like wasting time to just endure through something that we probably should have cared more about that's what life feels like. At least that's how I feel it's going. It's happening. You know? 
<clears throat> now there is no one way things to happen but there are it's always interesting to come up with a grid I was thinking why is nature so strange that it has create it has it has brought forth uh, nature has uh, has presented us with one world yet every creature due to having their own uh, sort of brain and mind you know reception of mind <clears throat> or brain receiver of mind <laughs> I see. it's like how is it that we're in the same place but we don't see it in the same way and for me I was like what is the advantage of that I, I felt like you know honestly guys some nights I feel like like right now we are at a pioneer stage and if we can think ahead do you know that means it's it's like I'm not thinking honestly of even this generation this this lot this lifetime of mine I don't know how much uh, communication is going to advance but I noticed that the smartest thing is to plant seeds now what does that mean planting seeds that you will not be uh, that will become trees you will not be here to sit under their shade for me the strategy is to the human attention is where ideas live. If you were a thought right now, like people are not thoughts, but if you were a thought, you would be dying to be in an attention, to be in a spotlight. If you treat yourself as a shape, that's you're literally going to feel like a, a piece, like a puzzle piece, and you're going to be like, what, 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 what am I the missing piece to? You know, you <laughs> you become your your ego um, becomes heavy or can become heavy. Just a second, guys. There's uh, hang in there. Okay, uh, all right guys, so I'm back. Uh, welcome everyone, good morning. Uh, to get back to this idea of being nature's artwork, that means, you know, I find it interesting. People go in a, a art gallery, but why is it that if when someone dislikes an artwork, they just don't run and start punching like the art, like the artwork? You know, <laughs> why is it that in the museum everybody is like a civilized, enlightened human being, walking past various forms and looking upon them, having an impression and value on them, but then moving past, moving beyond it? You know, a great ability in life. <clears throat> is to learn to run with it. It's kind of like the Wright brothers like running with like attempting to fly, you know? It's like, you know, the Wright brothers, the, the, imagine their parents one day were like, hey kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And both kids were like, we want to be birds! And their parents were like, "Oh, look at our kids. They want to be birds when they grow up. What a ridiculous answer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And then in the future, when they flew on the plane, the parents were like, holy shit, these kids became birds. They're flying in the sky, literally. <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm trying to find the right song. The song's called Night State, even though I'm speaking in the morning. Feels like a balance. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, honestly, what can I say about nature? We, we, we open our eyes in uh, a changing character, a character in the making. This character, I feel like when people ask what's the meaning of life, it's on, on some level you can't know it until the very end. You know, it's like you can't know <clears throat> how far you got up on, on the mountain when you're still climbing. So right now, human existence is the climbing, is the climbing stage. Now, there's something interesting about the human life that when it's young, it, it has a high optimal energy uh, and it's more of a physical creature. As it gets older, it grounds into more of a mental view. You know, there's this quote, I don't know who said it, but it said like when an old person remembers the past, it's as if they've lived it twice. Like an 80 year old person, it's as if when they remember the past, it's as if they've, they've lived 160 years, you know, to them in, 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 on an emotional level, you know. The mind is a very fascinating instrument. We don't know that much about that instrument. Anybody who tells you they do, it's such a hard problem to, to, uh, to, to wonder about that at, at this point where I'm like, it's such a hard problem to give an answer to where at this point we just need people to start asking the question. We just need people to start wondering about why is consciousness here and what is its relationship to where language is taking us. Imagine language is right now a boat. Language is a boat which are the programs that it, it, are moving civilization forth. That means imagine we created a language where in this language there was no dishonorable word. You know, that means that person, excuse my language, was shouting like fuck or something like that. <laughs> you know, that person using that term is like if they could use in any other word. It's just that became the word. You know, that became the sound. That became the thing experienced and used and uh, what not the language echoed. You see, so I'm saying if we were to create a new language and in this language, if, if even the negative context was done in the light of uh, the good, you see, the thing about language is that many people don't realize it's dualistic base. When you realize language is used when you want to express dualism, or a dual, like I say, duality is the father of infinity, and singularity, the singular dimension is the mother of the dualistic dimension. <clears throat> so right now, if you feel like a dualistic creature, most likely uh, the singular feels like a return to you, you know, or the infinite, which is the other edge, which is the opposite of the whole mystical return to this uh, supremacy of mind, why? 
you know. You know, I, I thought about it that there has been so many pilots, like when I was young, really young, I remember it was like the first time we got on a plane and my father, uh, me and my brother were really young. I have a twin brother. Took us to go see uh, the pilot's cabin. And because we were twins, the pilots were like, sure. It's like, how often do twins come to see the cabin? You know? <laughs> so seldom this is said, but uh, twin karma is usually good. <laughs> Now, what happens is, uh, not, not, nothing happens. We go in there and we see all this stuff, you know. We, the person says you can touch a button or something, you know. And I remember we leave. And that was like a very awe-inspiring moment for me. It was seeing like the hidden mind of the airplane, if I can say that. And then I thought, so we as a civilization, the Wright brothers, excellent work. They were right. You know, and <clears throat> they so we we mastered external piloting. Then the question came: How do we pilot the inner realms, or is it possible? And you might not believe how much of my lifetime I've dedicated to this question: Of is there a way that the creature is not the language? comes to the void, reuses the language, re-envisions, therefore not the, sa the same different pattern of information processing. The same, the same way suddenly man, let's say, discovered fire, I think probably fire was discovered when like lightning hit a tree, do you know? And that tree branch fell, and the caveman was like, yo, what is this? You know, and picked it up and ran to the others and threw it on a bush, and then everybody picked up it, and they started burning everything to keep the fire alive. <laughs> <coughs> it was, yeah, it is something that is sparked on this plant, on this plant. So I've, I've, this is, so Mr. Within's attempt at trying to see if it's possible to pilot the inner realms is first treating language as a technology, second treating yourself as attention. That language is moving in the attention. Right now, it's like these sounds are in movement. If you notice what we consider to be alive, its nature is moving. Do you know? There's something about movement that you you open rhythms. Your imagine your mind is this complex antenna, and if you endure, if you just have this persistence in one direction, let's say a long term concentration, <clears throat> if you have good concentration, you will be surprised that the mind, in its attempt at the action will at some point reach one moment where it has never experienced before of that action. And this antenna, <clears throat> in its every action that the person does,
If nature is perceived, perceived to be alive, the relationship with the unknown uh, becomes more than 50-50. That means in this life, we shouldn't see people as... Uh, we shouldn't measure. It's impossible to measure a changing system in a static way and think that painting's going to be all well, the history. You know? That painting's going to be uh, uh, the validity of everything. I feel this question that is the title is the same algorithm as the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Let me find this for you. Okay, there we go. So guys, this is <clears throat> Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you look at this closely, imagine you as a human being, you had won the battle of the physiological needs. Let us say you had ba uh, won the battle of safety, we're going up these levels. Let us say you had won the battles of love and belonging. You see, those are the game of society and the, and the maintenance of civilization. Up to the first three levels <clears throat> is how civilization is maintained and every human being should strive for. When it comes to self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others and respect by others, and then it says self-actualization, where it says morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem-solving, lack of prejudice and acceptance of facts. I mean... Sure, but let me tell you what I feel, what I mean by this, okay? As you go up these levels in, in, in civilization, when it gets up to self-actualization, that question of how is this self-actualized is the same way of wondering what is nature painting in the moment, you know? <clears throat> so self-actualization is really understanding where the idea of self comes from 
And the idea of self comes from you separating yourself from the world. You, the design of your legs and limbs is something that separates you. Do you know? That's your, I consider that the real objective evolution. <laughs> Maslow was a, a sociologist, guys. You should check out his work. This concept of self-actualization, I feel it is freedom, uh, unconditional freedom. And that unconditional freedom, you can find it in your inner realms or you can find it in your outer realms first. I mean, you can't really find it in your outer realms. You, you've... It, you, there's two types of wealth in this world. There's a wealth in front of your eyes and there's a wealth behind your eyes. <clears throat> the wealth behind your eyes is the is is has a value that is beyond time poetically. Somebody asked Plato back in the day uh uh asked Plato like uh what time is it? You know. <laughs> Of course, this is Mr. Within's kind of reanimation of this intentional reanimation of. <laughs> I'll tell you, somebody comes to Plato, imagine, and says, "Hey, Plato, what time is it?" And Plato's like, "Bro, does it look like I got a sundown?" You know. <laughs> and then, I'm joking. Plato doesn't say that. Plato says, "Time is the moving image of eternity." Imagine he doesn't have a sundial, and Plato's like, okay, I don't know what the time is, but I'm a philosopher. Let's see. It's like definitely some answer can be given. <laughs> <clears throat> and Plato says, time is the moving image of eternity. The self-actualization, Mr. Within finds, let me just say it like this, uh, is this inseparability of how you have lived as an individual to yourself and how everything beyond literally your eyes and your skin outside of you is a collective stance. Everybody is existentially equal, you know, unless you were a clone or a, a cyberspace virtual kind of AI conscious creature, you know? A cyberspace creature, let's say. <clears throat> the inseparability of The cosmic activity with the individual activity rendering attention as the bridge in between. Your attention <coughs> is moving the meaning of your senses. That means right now, if you are a human being and you look at this world, you're a biological being and this biological creaturehood is processing reality so now we are wondering about how is it processing reality and we see there's certain stimulus from outside but there's also inner stimulus and there's also the whole biological body like when the person gets hungry or thirsty or something that intervenes with uh, uh, their 
inner realm activity. <clears throat> There's been times where I've been so concentrated on the inner realms that I've been distracted literally in the outer realms, but the film was still playing in the background. So I could keep, I could exactly know uh, um, what I was speaking, uh, what image I was speaking about. For me, this has been kind of the progression. First, I picked up the pen and <clears throat> it's hilarious, but uh, <laughs> uh, when I <clears throat> was like uh, <clears throat> in grade three in Toronto, uh, the teacher, sorry, not grade three, grade four, I was given, uh, what do you call, extra cursive handwriting homework. I don't know what the teacher, the teacher had extra copies and he's like, here kid, have all. <laughs> you know, the teacher didn't know what to do with the extra copies of, 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 of the handwriting cursive thing, so he literally gave me a stack. <laughs> and I remember I went home constantly trying. So I remember a moment in my life where I was attempting to even move my hand properly on the paper. Then it got to a point where I opened up, my inner realms opened up, and op I became conscious of my own inner realms, and my hand started writing. I started writing a lot, a ridiculous amount. Even way before I gave these talks, I wrote a lot. I managed to put up most of the poetic poetry up, but there's also so many books that I haven't met, had the time to up, uh, up, uh, put on. You know, I'll name some titles for you. Heaven of Principia, um, Gift of Fibonacci, The Inventor's Sphere, Vision Extraction, Hidden Engineer, uh, The Highway Building, uh, The Highway to the Stars. It has a bigger title though. Building a Highway to the Star Highway of Stars, something like that. That's a very geometrical book. Uh, there was more. Oh, uh, the ancient listeners, yeah. And there's many more, but these were what I had written before I had started these talks in The only therapy, Nicola, in the chat section, is to realize you have been the pilot of your attention from the beginning. Everything else is within it. You see, mysticism was very strange. I, I think in India back in the day, if you were a kid and you were depressed and you were like, yo, I'm depressed, your friends would be, oh my God, you know? Our body's depressed. What do we do? They would go tell the guy, go to some enlightened guru. The guy would go to the enlightened guru, not these artificial, like, <clears throat> what is it? Like some factories manufacturing uh, gurus in India, guys. It's hilarious. You know, it's so artificial, their behavior. But <laughs> Guys, two of the books are accessible online. Um, one is called Cationic Imprints and the other is called Contortions of Affordable Grace. Those people can uh, actually purchase. If you like them, They're, they are written by a different me in the past, you know. But anyways... <clears throat> I don't know what man ultimately can do in this world. It just seems like we left the jungle 
So we stepped out of the environment used to be our mind and now we separated from the environment a little bit and we have become our own minds. You know, we have become uh, the jurisdiction uh, decider, you know. <clears throat> so we are, you know, it's like <clears throat> wolves piss to show their territory, human beings conceptualize to <laughs> show their territory or their reality. You know, for me, it's um, all I can do when I look at my biology is salute the cells of my existence. Just salute life's effort so far. You know, life is honestly like I, I don't know, there was a moment I, re I really, this, this sank in and I don't know, I just noticed that <clears throat> everybody is endlessly living for perfection and progress not realizing at some point the light's going to be switched off. And so it would be this endless chasing of a dream and noticing that how could that be the real world, you know? For me, um, chaos is still chaotic, you know? I remember seeing, I mean, I'm not going to mention it here, but like, I, like, like the, the human being sees many chaotic things. But just like a bird, you have to manage to pilot away from it. Or be a lion and change it, you know? Depends on your nature. This world is <clears throat> a process, ultimately, a process that we classify. And once you see the edges of how you have classified your inner realms, you look at the outer realms. Once you look at the outer realms and you see the endless unknown probabilistic things, that are happening like when you even think of the butterfly effect as they say like how the wing of a butterfly flapping in the air could also cause like a guillotine for example to chop ahead in uh, France back in the day you know it would be the total uh, emergence of an irrational universe and I feel that's what uh, science uh, is very concerned about. That means I, I totally see science has to stand under the shield of materialism because if the self becomes multidimensional, then there is no, no individual. You know, but we can't ignore uh, the collective potentials of the civilization. There's this story of this guru in nature. It's a Vedic story back in the day.
Anyways, guys, the story is this uh, guru tells one of his disciples, go get water from the river for everybody. He gives them like this bucket, wooden bucket back in the day. <clears throat> and the disciples like, okay, I'll go with this. And he says, where's the river? And the guru's like, come on, man, we've been in nature so long. Like, trust your intuition. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy goes. He goes and he walks and he suddenly hears the this voice, the sound of a river and his sense and his intuition and his memories and everything come returning to him. And he finds the river and he goes there. <clears throat> and he goes there and he puts the bucket in the water and he's staring at the water in the, filling up the bucket, the bucket being filled up with water. Then he suddenly turns to his left and he sees this incredible woman, this incredible, beautiful girl, you know. And what happens is he drops the bucket. <laughs> You know, he's like, at that point, the bucket was, his hand was like, why am I holding a bucket? <laughs> he sees this incredibly beautiful woman, and remember, this story is back in the day, and so he lets go of the bucket, and he walks up to her, and he says, I'm in love with you. You got to marry me. And we have to also consider the sort of woman's rights back in the day. What I mean by that is women uh, were not allowed to go outside that much or travel or whatnot. So you can see that for the girl, this is a rare occurrence, like this situation that this guy out of nowhere comes has come and said this. You know, the girl is smart though, and the girl says, "Okay." <laughs> she doesn't say okay. She says, "You got to come and speak to my father." get his blessings, and I'm going to eavesdrop, and based on your answer, I'm going to choose to marry you. <clears throat> and uh, the guy is so in love, it's as if it's, for him, it's a sort of divine calling of his life. It's like, what can he do? You know, he has, he, he, whether he's intelligent or foolish, he's being pulled to that moment, you know? Love is like a gravitational field for the mind and the subjective individual. <clears throat> what happens is this guy says, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and he finds himself that moment where this, this disciple of this yogi, like he's, he's, he's dressed like a sadhu and whatnot, you know, He's there, and the father of the girl, he goes to the village and whatnot, and he's in there, and the girl's listening from outside the door, and the father's like, who are you? <laughs> and he says, I want to marry your daughter, you know? And, um, how does the story go? The father says, tell me about your background, you know, tell me about your education. The guy's like, I'm a yogi in the forest, what can I tell this guy? And he's like, yeah, I've, I'm, you know, I'm a anthropologist. <laughs> You know, I study primitive ways of living. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, you know, I have a, you know, a degree in psychology. The guy's just a yogi in nature. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he says, he, sa he gives an answer. And, but there's one thing that one quality he has that he is honest. He's honest with the father-in-law. And the father-in-law sees this, that there's this honest, healthy attention, you know, uh, from this person, you know. And <clears throat> what happens is the father-in-law says, Un only under one condition, I will give you my blessing. I have never had a son. I have only had daughters. And you have to forever... After this moment, if I give you my blessing, and this marriage happens, after this moment, you have to be like the son I never had, and you have to live in this village forever, and after I die, the father was a huge landowner, like the yogi, like the yogi had no clue. <laughs> you know, it was a con, as they would say. 
Khan, you know. <clears throat> and so, the, like a huge land owner of the village, you know. And the guy's like, after I die and get old, you're going to be the landowner, you know. And the guy is so in love, so drawn to this moment, that he says yes, you know. And so, you know, wedding bells are heard, and years go by, and probably, you know, he's like, holy shit, those guys are so thirsty. <laughs> he has kids, you know, he has a daughter, then he has a son, you know, and then the father-in-law, yeah, the, yeah, the father-in-law experiences uh, what it's like having a son, you know, and uh, the father-in-law passes away and he becomes the landowner and it's such a remarkable thing. It's a lovely family and one evening he's there on, a, on this hill looking at the village, looking at their home on this high hill of this uh, place they were living. And the children are there playing around and he's hugging his wife, you know, and they're looking at this sunset. Suddenly, suddenly, to their shock, the guy's like, what is that in the background? He suddenly notices something. He sees its tidal waves. It's a tsunami or something. And these tidal waves destroy the village. He can see the whole village getting destroyed up to his house. And the waves are coming higher and higher and higher and they're getting super close and he's just in this shock and remember years have gone by and he was living this sort of paradise perfection of a life you know and suddenly to his shock to his heart he sees his son fall into the river the daughter goes to save the son the daughter gets pulled into the waters the wife goes to save the children the wife gets pulled into the waters and he is stuck there in shock in that moment in that moment he hears a voice hey <laughs> hey take out the take the bucket out of the water what's the hold up he suddenly snaps out he sees the hand is still on the bucket he is standing there he looks to his left he sees no girl he sees the guru and the crew and then the guru suddenly looks at him and he realizes in one instant he created the love of his life he created a father-in-law he created a children family he created the end of his life you know, he created all these dimensions in an instant when he was, the bucket was there in the water. Now tell me how vast nature's artwork is. Us thinking we're just linear uh, creatures in uh, linear materialistic time, thinking it's that easy. Yeah, you think it's that easy, that it's just what we see, that is what we are? I wish it was that easy, but no, it's a moving picture, it's a moving film, and all knowledge is, 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 is making it a picture it can put on the wall. That's, I, that's, that's ideology, yet it must be honored because it's, language is a technology. It's like, I can tell you poetically, I have a love and hate relationship with language. It terrifies me when I see how primitive it can keep human beings, but it, it makes me inspired when I see how far it can make our eyes uh, being beyond the clouds. I remember I told at this uh, kind of business event, <laughs> I remember I had a chance to speak to this um, person it was like a you know gathering event uh, kind of media event believe it or not. and in that event
Sorry guys, just um I was just checking something on the screen. Uh pretty much I told that story to this um uh, uh researcher there, um the scientist, um not a neurologist, but this thing that he said. <laughs> um he was taught we were talking about consciousness and I should I remember I shared that story with him and I was like that's the phenomenon that's how malleable time is it's not just malleable that we saw time in a certain way that Albert uh, uh, Albert uh, Einstein came and said space and time are uh, they interesting you know And it's remarkable. The more you, if you could move at the speed of light, <laughs> imagine you were running in the cosmos. Let's try a thought experiment right now. Imagine you were running in the cosmos in outer space, and you are running faster than a light beam. And there's this light beam, like this guided thing, like following you, like this guided drone following you, this light beam. Okay, so you are a creature that has moved faster than the speed of is no light. That means an object can speed up into, to, into the inconceivable, toward, is speeding up towards the inconceivable. The more higher speed things become, uh, we can say, um, imagine like you were holding something in your hand. <clears throat> And this thing, this object, let's say like in quantum physics, how they see the electron in two, it's as if imagine you hold an, uh, your phone in your hand and your phone with a sort of, like in a nanosecond, in, like so fast, changing uh, positions from the two positions. Okay, here's the thing. Imagine you hold, you had two phones, you held them in your hand. Now imagine you kept your hands in the same position, but you took away one phone. And that one phone that was in your hand you were wondering about it constantly being replaced from hand to hand teleport style okay so if you could envision this sort of constant teleportation between the two at a speed getting conceivable so it's as if like is the creature in two places at once or is it moving so fast between two places that it appears in two places I think it's interesting to look at yourself and how would I say it? You are a brush stroke in the cosmos <coughs> on the I don't know in which uh, that means imagine an un onion style multidimensionality. Imagine we are one of the inner layers of the onion. This whole cosmos, imagine it's an onion. If you're an onion salesman hearing this, you'll be like, I never thought this day would come. <laughs>
this talk in the 